sister say amen again. Amen. We praise God tonight for everyone who's gathered here amen. with the purpose of teaching and admonishing one another amen. and building up each other in our most holy and common faith. Amen. We're thankful for uh, the song leader of the night, yes. for his enthusiasm and zeal, and for all of you and uh, your, your purpose, glorification of God. Amen. We thank you again to Brother Watkins and the brothers for this invitation, and not only in the preach and the teach this weekend, but also uh, for the invitation to eat this afternoon uh, in the members' home. We enjoyed that. That was better than any restaurant could have provided. And home cooked and Christian fellowship. And we thank God for that. Uh, it was delightful and great. If you have been here uh, this weekend and this morning and this night, you are doing exceedingly well. Yeah. Uh, and you're also exceedingly tired. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Because you've been going and going and going. And you like to think that you like the ever ready uh, but. battery button. <laughs> but you know it ain't like that all the time. Amen. Yeah. Right. Sometimes you gotta get some rest. Yeah. And we trust that in a few minutes, relatively speaking. And you will be getting some rest. Good to have all of the preachers and leaders and visitors who are with us on this afternoon. And we just want to take a few minutes to introduce uh, the base, the foundation of what we shall be talking about uh, later on uh, this week. So let's look at Romans 16, verses 16 through 18, and we'll take our message from there. We trust because I write pretty hard that boy and I won't get into it. <laughs> Romans 16, 16 is a familiar passage uh, for many of us. And it reads there, uh, salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Yeah. Now, Paul says the churches of Christ salute you. He could have simply said that I salute you. Yeah. And those who work with me salute you. Mm -hmm. But Paul knows of a greater brotherhood yeah. right. than just himself and those who work with him. So as he addresses the church at Rome, the church to which he had not come, he wants not only to address them from his perspective, but he wants them to understand that there is a body of believers, churches scattered throughout the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. right. who are fellow workers with every worker, every brother, and every sister who is in Rome. And so he says, the churches of Christ Salute you. Yeah. More than this, he says to uh, this church, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good word, and bad speeches, they deceive the heart of the sinful. And we're not going to spend a lot of time this evening on those verses, but the fact that Paul talks about the possibility of divisive teaching and people indicates to us that when Paul is talking about uh, the churches of Christ, what he wants them to focus on is unity yeah, right. both among themselves and with all others who are members of the churches of Christ. Right. Now we often read this phrase, but it's almost an empty phrase because we don't usually or generally conceptualize what Paul is talking about when he says the churches of Christ salute you. Yeah. To discover some of those churches Paul has in mind, one can read simply the chapter, the 16th chapter of 1 Corinthians. 
It began there with various provinces that were the homes of many of the churches of Christ that Paul established himself. One of those passages is familiar to you in that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 16 in verse number 1. As now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to uh, the churches of Galatia, uh -huh. even so do ye. Yeah, right. In 161 then, we know that some of the churches of Christ were in Galatia. Right. First Corinthians 16 and 5, Paul says, I hope to come to you when I pass through Macedonia. Yeah. And I do pass through Macedonia in verse number 5. And so some of those churches of Christ were in Macedonia. Yeah. Right. He says in 1 Corinthians 16, uh, then at verse number 15, he says he speaks of the first fruits of a king. So that some of the churches of Christ are in a king. Yeah. Then in verse number 19 of that chapter, he talks about the churches of Asia. When one was to think of the churches of Christ, he's thinking of churches in Galatia, Macedonia, and Achaia, and Asia. Now what these represent here are Paul's three missionary journeys. On the first missionary journey, he was in Galatia. In the second missionary journey, Paul traveled through Macedonia and Achaia. And then on the third missionary journey, Paul spent three years in Asia. Uh -huh. Not only do they represent Paul's journeys, but they are the construction of the book of Acts. Acts 13 and 14 was Paul in Galatia. In 15 was the Jerusalem conference, but in 16 through 18, Paul was in Macedonia and Achaia. And then in chapter 19, going into chapter 20, Paul is in Asia. The rest of the book has Paul in prison and waiting to be appear before Caesar. But Paul again says to the church at Rome, Churches of Christ salute you. But what churches are in Galatia, Macedonia, Achaia, and Asia? On the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas were first on the island of Cyprus. They crossed over in the Perga of Pamphylia, and John Mark left the work. They went from there to Pisidian Antioch, and they left Pisidian Antioch and went into Iconium. After they left Iconium, they went into Lystra and then into Derby. And these were the churches that Paul is talking about when he says, uh, As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Yeah. On the second missionary journey, remember Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia who said, come on into Macedonia yes. and help us. Paul landed in Philippi. In Philippi, he converted Lydia, and then he converted the jail. He went to Philippi, to Thessalonica. He left Thessalonica and went to Berea. And remember, he had a hard time in Thessalonica, so that when he went to Berea, the text says in Acts chapter 17, those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica, yeah, right. and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and sat the scriptures daily to see whether they were so. He right. left there and he went into Corinth, and that's what the Bible says in 18, that Paul learned that there are much people in the city. He stopped first at Athens in Greece and then into Corinth. And so when one reads about the churches of Macedonia and the Caia and Galatia, he's talking about the city in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra and Derby, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens and Corinth, and they were churches of Christ. And the other thing is, they learned that although they were in different provinces, scattered over hundreds of miles, they learned to work together yeah. and manifest unity. Yes. Right. Now, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least nine churches here so far scattered over miles who are the churches of Christ, and they are all working I know they were working together because Paul says to those in Achaia, as I have given right to the churches of Galatia. What that was going on in Galatia on that point was also going on in Achaia. But it was not only going on in Galatia and Achaia. Remember Paul right in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse number 1. We do you the week better about the churches of Macedonia. How that in the great time of a 
church in a deep poverty, they will give it to the Lord. And not only in Macedonia and Achaia and those texts, but the Bible shows us in Romans 15, 25, and 26. We read it yesterday that it pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution to the saints who are in Jerusalem. So Galatia, Macedonia, Achaia, all we're going to worship for these nine churches in unity. Yeah. Mm. Working together over hundreds of miles. Yeah. And today, in many of our cities, you can't get three churches <laughs> to work together. Yeah. Mm. We wonder why we don't have, and this was on a difficult subject. This was on, they were working together on money. <laughs> <laughs> on money! Oh, you know, and our brotherhood is important. How do you know churches can cooperate? Well, they cooperate. Yeah. Right. They chose people to take this money to Jerusalem. Yeah. Right. And they worked together. And if you want to see a state, a city, a city, a county, a state where the strong church, church of Christ, then you must see strong churches of Christ. Yeah. That is, the more we work together, yeah. the more we can accomplish. Yeah. Right. We've got some strong, mighty preachers, right. leaders, and elders in our brotherhood talking this talk about, I just need to be concerned about my church over here. When your church over here is not the only church, supposed to be the only church in the world. Right. Right. If your church is a church of Christ, learn to work with somebody else. Yes, they were all working together. But these, of course, were not the only churches. Those of you who read the Bible know that there were several churches in Asia. Paul And Paul was in Asia, in Ephesus. But you know, John's letter was to seven churches. Churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Colossae was there, Herodotus was there. You had another nine, ten, or eleven churches there. You had twenty churches yeah. across the provinces yes, saluting the church in Rome. The churches of Christ salute you. My contention is tonight, one of the things that is weakening churches of Christ is that we have uh, uh, advanced a false teaching about autonomy mm -hmm. to excuse ourselves when we are not on the mission. Autonomy is not about my church does what it wants to do. Because your only mission is Jesus' commission. Mm. He commissioned the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preach. The autonomy that you're talking about comes from two Greek words, autos and namos, self-rule, self-law. What that means is that your leadership is developed in your congregation. Your shepherds, your pastors, they come from you, 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 you self do that. But that does not mean, elder or preacher or leader, that you cut your congregation off from every other congregation. Yeah. 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 We ought to be supporting one another. Yes, Many of these denominations do a lot of what they do because they work together. Yes, sir. You have to understand, it's small money for you. You can't work together. And it's small minded churches that don't work together. People will say, we've got these differences. Don't you understand? Uh, you have to work through your differences. They had differences in these churches, but they didn't cut themselves off from one another. Didn't they have problems in Galatia? In Galatia, there was some folk on a certain size every man they could get their hands on. <laughs> Paul said in chapter five, for freedom, Christ has set us free. They had problems in Philippi. That's what like, it doesn't like it. They had folks standing on the hill waiting for Jesus to come again. Mm. So much so that some men were not working. And Paul had to say, if you don't work, don't let it eat you. Mm. In Corinth, you know they had problems. They were divided. They were perpetuating gifts. A man had his father's wife. They had problems in Corinth. But the church in Galatia couldn't say, well, I don't want anything to do with the church in Corinth. They got, they got problems in that church. Every church got problems. Yes, sir. Amen. One of his biggest problems is the person in the church being divisive. Yeah. Right. Wanting to be insular Amen. and not wanting to cooperate with others. Who made us the law right. about everything going on in another church? 
Some churches even espouse that doctrine. They're going to they gonna withdraw from another church. Give me the pen, let me drop it again. <laughs> well, it ain't on such and such. I'm going to withdraw from that whole church. Who are you? Withdraw from a whole church. Want <laughs> somebody? And when it happened, and even when Paul had brought people who were problematic in these churches, he didn't say the whole church was no good. They had problematic people in Ephesus. Yeah. Paul said that many and Alexander, Phineas, those names were tankers in the church. And they had thrown up on the tank of some, but he didn't say the whole church in Ephesus is withdrawn from. Right. Because what Paul wants us to focus on is learning how to be unified. Yes. Right. Amen. Right. Now what I'm going to show you uh, this week is that what they were unified across doctrinal lines. All of these churches had to do the same thing to get into Christ Jesus. They had to do the same thing. What was taught in Galatia about salvation was taught in Macedonia, Achaia, and Asia. And, they, and we're going to talk about the, the unity of their worship and the unity of their government and the unity of their mission. And they were unified in that. But let me, let me do this and that because I'm just about out of time. Time in every province. They came to Jesus by hearing the gospel, yeah, right. believing the gospel, right. repenting, confessing, and being baptized. Yeah, right. I know they were baptized in Galatia because Paul says to them in Galatians 3.26, we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Paul, as many of you, as have been baptized in the Christ, as everybody in Galatia, and put on Christ. If you were in the church in Galatia, you were baptized in the Christ and put on Christ. We know they were baptized in Philippi. The Bible says the Lord opened her heart so she attended under the word that was spoken by Paul. And then she was baptized. The jailer and all his house were baptized. And it happened throughout uh, Macedonia. We know they were baptized in Corinth, Acts 18, in verse number 8. The Bible says Chris was the chief ruler of the house, was uh, believed. I uh, was baptized, and many of the Corinthians hear it, believe, and were baptized. They were baptized in Asia. Paul writes to the church, there's one body, one spirit, even as you call in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one day, and one baptism. Baptism in Asia. Baptism in Achaia. Baptism in Macedonia. And baptism in Galatia. Churches of Christ salute you. Yeah. Them which call divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. If they did it in Galatia, Macedonia, Canada, and Asia, then guess what? In Connecticut, right. they're going to be saved. Woo. They got to do the same thing yeah. they did in Galatia, Macedonia, Achaia, and Asia. Yeah. 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 Believe, repent, confess, and be yes, That's yeah. what the Bible teaches. The churches of Christ salute you. Yeah. 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 Too many people. We've gotten away with pushing this idea. And you stay on your side of town and y'all do y'all thing. We stay on our side of town and we do our thing. We are brothers and sisters yes. in Christ. Yes. We can do more together than we can do apart. We gotta get tired of little buildings with little purpose, doing little things with little people who don't want to grow up. Right. And the Bible says God can do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask for them. To Him be glory in the church. By Christ Jesus. Throughout all ages. Wow! Without it, the church of Christ is for the glory of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are so God can be glory. In his people, the churches of Christ salute you. Yes, sir. You know, you got them in East Hartford, East Connecticut, and West Connecticut, and all around. But we are brothers and sisters. We ought to learn, we ought to be big enough to put differences aside and work together. Yes, mm -hmm. Because when we think about that passage, we think it all the time. Mark that was called the Benjamin Office of the Country, then we think they talk about somebody else. That's us. <laughs> Perpetuating disunity among the people of God. If you're here tonight, there is glory in the church. 
Because the church is cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's glory in the church tonight because Jesus sits as its head. King of kings and Lord of lords. There's glory in the church tonight because it's washed, sanctified, and justified. It's members of it. That's right. And you're going to be all right in the sight of it. You're going to be saved and you need to be in Christ and in the church tonight. You come like they came in Galatia, Macedonia, Achaia, and Asia. All right. Uh, hearing the gospel, believing that Jesus died for your sins and buried and rose again. And not only that, be willing to repent our life outside of Christ, confess with Jesus as Lord, He's your living Lord. Be buried in baptism with Him. Sins are washed away, sanctified by the sprinkled blood of Jesus Christ. First Peter 1, verse number 2. And if you're in the church, and especially if you're a leader, do you promote unity of churches of Christ? Or the vision because you know somebody with that other church people is one of his daddy's wife. But some things are more important than the petty things we use to separate ourselves. And here's the thing God is so good that he allows us to live, to learn how to please him and do that. This is a blessing tonight to be able to investigate God's word and to share with one another. And if you're here tonight and you need to rededicate your life, rededicate your commitment, you need prayer. Then as we sing the invitation song, you're invited to come. And now that you're God, you're invited to come right now. As together we stand and sing. Come to Jesus.